So thankful for this time that we've had to worship the Lord together this morning. And um, it's, as always, it's so good to be with you. It's so uh, exciting to have the opportunity to worship the Lord with you. And um, I'm so thankful for Pastor Matt and just trusting me with the, the opportunity to come and minister to you today. Um, I, I do feel <clears throat> very compelled in my spirit. I, I do feel that God has given me a word um, for you, some things that God has been dealing with me about personally. And I just want to share those things with you. And so if you would turn with me to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, uh, you may be seated this morning. The Old Testament book of Ezekiel chapter 22, the Old Testament book of Ezekiel chapter 22, and we're really going to be <clears throat> taking the message this morning from just one verse um, in Ezekiel chapter 22, and that's verse 30. So if you would turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. You know, I believe that if you have walked with the Lord for any amount of time, regardless of your closeness to Him or maybe the lack thereof, I believe that you would have to take an honest, if you were to take an honest look, an honest assessment of our world in this time and hour in which we living, we are living, I, I believe you would have to admit, you would have to say, you would have to acknowledge that this world is on a fast track towards judgment. It seems as though every part of our world, not just governments, but every part of our world, it seems, is becoming anti-God and anti-Christ. And, and there, there's an agenda in this world. And, and the Bible talks about this. This is not a new thing. Uh, from the beginning of time, actually the psalmist said in Psalms 2, from the beginning of time, there's, there's been a spirit in this world that, that, that fights the intentions and the purposes of God in the world. From the beginning of time, uh, there's been a spirit at work in the world that, that tries to overthrow uh, the purposes and the intentions of God. And the Bible says that, that God looks down from heaven upon that spirit that tries to war and to fight against his intentions and purposes. And he literally laughs at it because at the end of the day, God is going to have the final word. Yeah. At the end of the day, his church, his people are going to rise in victory. They're going to be more than conquerors, uh, as his word has told us. But and so we look at our society, we, we look at the trajectory of our generation, and we would have to admit that we are, in fact, on a fast track towards judgment. Mm -hmm. But even though that is the case and that is the truth. It is also the truth that God is intending to show mercy to this generation. Amen. It, it is the truth that God is intending out of this wicked and sinful, rebellious generation to save men and women from their sin and, and to use their lives to have, an, have a lasting impact upon this world for the cause of Jesus Christ. And so although... This world as a whole is on a fast track towards judgment. God is intending to show men and women mercy in this time and in this hour. But beloved, what I want you to know and what I hope that we can see by the end of this message is that if God is in fact going to show mercy to people in this generation, individuals or, or groups as a whole, if God is in fact going to get his glory and going to save men out of this sinful and out of this rebellious generation, beloved, it's going to have to be through you. Yes. Amen. If God is going to save a people in this world, in this moment and in this time, it will have to be through his body, the church. That's it. In every generation that God intended to manifest his glory and to show his mercy, he would always raise up a people through whom he could do that. He always would. And God's heart in this generation is no different. He intends to show mercy to people in this generation. But if he's going to do it, he has to have a vessel and an instrument through which he could display that mercy and that love. And so I want to read to you just one verse from Ezekiel chapter 22. And in verse 29, just very briefly, what, what the Lord is, is really telling Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, he, he's speaking about the nation of Israel at this time. And 
What he's saying is, is, is because of their, uh, their rebellion, because of their recalcitrance, because of their refusal to, to heed the word and the will of God, uh, this society has become, this world, as it were, has become a, a very self-centered world. They've, they've long since forgotten about God. They've, they've long since forgotten about His purposes. And, and it's not only crept into uh, the homes of the day, but even the prophets and the priests, those who are supposed to be making a difference in, in that particular generation, they had long since uh, uh, forgotten about the Lord and they had fallen so short of His purposes. And so the Lord is saying in, in verse 29, He's really just summing up the chapter uh, that these people have fallen so far away from me. They, they had fallen so far that, that their lives were being lived in such a way that it warranted my judgment. But this is what God says to the prophet Ezekiel. That before that judgment came, he says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. And I just want to minister to you this morning this thought, the evidence of God's mercy. The evidence of God's mercy. Let's pray. God, I come to you this morning and I do so in the name of your son Jesus. And Lord, I just want to say to you, Father, that I, I love you with all of my heart. And, and Father, as we have sang today, and, and as the Word has been shared and, and has been preached this morning already, Father, we, we are a people who stand in awe of Your love for us, God. God, the only reason, God, that there is an opportunity for there to be affection and adoration in our hearts for You is because of the love Father, that you have shown us, that you have demonstrated to us by sending your son Jesus, God, to dwell with us, to die for us, and now as your people to live within us, God. We are in awe of your goodness, Father. We are in awe of who you are, Father. And Father, I just thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that you have given me to stand before these, your people. And Father, I just pray that in the next few moments, God, you would give me the ability, Father, to elucidate, God, the thoughts that you have placed in my heart uh, concerning this particular text, Father. God, I just pray that you would give every one of us eyes to see. You would give us ears to hear. And you would give us a heart to receive what you're saying to us in this time and in this moment. And God, it is my desire that by the end of this service, that Jesus, the Christ, God, that he would be seen, that he would be sought after, and that he would be known by men and women, God, in this assembly. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Ezekiel was a priest living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack on Israel. Uh, Babylon, in this particular instance, uh, they spared the city of Jerusalem itself, but they took with them a number of captives back to Babylon, of which Ezekiel uh, was a part. And the book of Ezekiel itself, it begins some five years later, after this initial uh, 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 exiling of the people from their homeland, it begins with Ezekiel uh, among the captives in Babylon. And what we find in Ezekiel chapter 1 is that as Ezekiel uh, is sitting next to this river in Babylon, uh, God begins to speak to him and to give him these incredible visions. He says in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 1 that I was among the captives and the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. And, and, and though these visions were uh, extremely, incredibly enlightening, the things that Ezekiel began to see in Ezekiel chapter 1 were not particularly uh, delightful. Uh, in, a, in a great sense, these visions, these things that Ezekiel began to see, they were rather disturbing and frightening because what God was beginning to reveal to Ezekiel was how he truly felt concerning his people's sin and the judgment that had and would continue to come as a result of their rebellion and their rejection of him. Because although God had been patient, although he had been long suffering, although he had been forbearing with his people, uh, they had Israel, they had already in a sense been judged 
And an even more devastating day of judgment was soon to come. Uh, a day that Ezekiel refers to as the day of the wrath of the Lord. A day when God would visit his people, but not particularly uh, in the way that they would uh, desire him to. And it is in the midst of, of this revelation, in the midst of this revelation of God's displeasure towards Israel's sin... It's in the midst of this where Ezekiel comes to an understanding of his calling to be a prophet. A prophet in that time was really just a spirit-inspired voice to that generation. And so Ezekiel begins to learn in the midst of these disturbing and frightening visions, he begins to learn that in the midst of this, this callous and uncompliant society, he was being raised up to faithfully declare the mind and the heart of God to that generation. As we already said, Israel was already suffering the consequence of her sin. Be because of her rejection of God, they had been taken uh, as prisoners. They had been taken captive uh, of a foreign empire. But what we see at the outset of the book of Ezekiel is that even though the people had been taken captive by this foreign empire because of their own sin, because of their own rebellion, what we begin to see in Ezekiel chapter 1, if you'll just capture the picture, is that God's spirit did not stay in Jerusalem while his people were carried away as exiles into a foreign land. God was with his people in Babylon. God, God should have been speaking, it seems. God should have been speaking to some priest in the temple back in Jerusalem. But here is the presence of God meeting with Ezekiel on the side of a river among the captives in Babylon. Uh, among the rebels. Uh, among the defectors, among these sinful group of people, here was God speaking to and dealing with his people through the person of Ezekiel. Amen. Now, what God had to say to them was not all favorable, I'll have you to know, but, but there he is speaking to them nonetheless. Amen. Amen. And so we see that even though, and some would say that the reason that God's spirit departed from Jerusalem was so that he could bring judgment upon it. And I believe that. But I also believe that God's spirit leaving Jerusalem and walking with them into Babylon, it was just a sign and an evidence of God's care and concern for his people, even though they had rejected him and had rebelled against him long ago. And so what we begin to see through the book of Ezekiel, and it really, I believe, is summed up in Ezekiel chapter 22, what we begin to see is the resultant state of a people who have determined to live their lives apart from the instruction and influence of God. Uh, the, the, the state, if you will, the state of a people who have charted their own course and have denied God of his rightful place in leading and directing their lives. Mm -hmm. And if you read Ezekiel chapter 22 very carefully, I believe that it eerily, scarily uh, reflects the world in which we presently live and the indictments that I believe that God would have against genera this generation. And, and ultimately, I'm not going to read through the book of Ezekiel 22. It's rather long and, and complex. But I believe that if you read through, the, through Ezekiel chapter 22, ultimately what you're going to find is that this people, Israel, they had been arrested, as it were, by the dominating forces of the age. They, they were held hostage, if you will, by a power greater than themselves. If you see Israel... Uh, compared to who they were initially created and designed by God to be. And you looked at them now, you would have to say that they had totally and completely lost their true identity and their true sense of purpose. Wow. In, in, in light of who they were created and raised up by God to be, this, this light to the Gentiles, now they were falling so woefully and dramatically short of what it is that God had purposed and intention for their lives. 
It was obvious, maybe not to them, because they had sunk so far in their rebellion, but it was obvious to the world around them that they were not who God had destined them to be, and they were not doing what God had destined them to do. Because they had lived for so long, absent of God's influence in their lives, they they began to mirror the heathen nations in their practices and in their demeanors. Mm -hmm. And what you find in Ezekiel 22 is that this society that, that was initially raised up by God to be a blessing to the world around them, they had become a very self focused and self centered society. From the top to the bottom, this is what God is saying in Ezekiel 22, summed up by the time you get to chapter to, to, to verse 29. What, what, what God is saying is that from the top to the bottom, men have little to no regard for God or for one another. Their, their, their focus has completely turned inward. Wow. The, the, the main characteristic of, of this society and this religion was furthering themselves at the expense of of other people. Help us, Lord. The, the main characteristic of their lives, God is saying in verse 29 of Ezekiel 22, is that they are willing to further themselves. The, 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 the way that they want to live and the things that they want to do, that they're, they're willing to do that at the expense of other people's lives and at the expense of other people having an opportunity to know God in reality. Help us, Lord. This had become the norm of the day. Their focus, as we said, had been completely turned inward. And what's most troubling to me about the book of Ezekiel, in particular Ezekiel 13 and Ezekiel 22, what's most troubling to me is that even the prophets and the priests, those who should have been leading the people to God, were in essence telling the people that they could continue to live their lives apart from God's instruction and influence and that they would not face repercussions for doing Help so. Help us, Lord. The, 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 the prophets and the priests, those who should have been uh, interceding on behalf of the people and those who should have been speaking to the people on behalf of God, they, they, they convinced the people that they could continue to live their lives apart from the instruction and the influence of God and that there would not be any consequence or repercussion for doing so. The prophets, false prophets as they were, the prophets in that day were prophesying that, that judgment was far off. They were prophesying that the day of the Lord was not near. They were prophesying that the people of their day did not need to worry about that which was, was to come. Uh, they were prophesying that everything was just going to get better. They were promising the people in that generation a trouble-free future when the promise was not theirs to make. Because as you read history, Israel's future would not be anything but troubled following this time frame. Those who should have been interceding for the people and those who should have been pleading with the people to turn to God were so occupied with their own lives that they failed to see that God was intending to use them as instruments of mercy and salvation in light of a coming judgment. They failed to see that God was intending. And he was not intending to fill their mouths with flattery, to, to tell people just what they wanted to hear. He, no, but he was intending to use them as instruments of mercy and salvation in light of a sure, a certain coming judgment. Because although Israel had already suffered so much, they were going to suffer even greater in the days ahead. And God was intending in that generation as he always has to show mercy. You see, although Israel in this time, and you can read Ezekiel 22 when you get home, I believe it will help you to capture the heart of what we're saying today, but although they were living in a way that warranted the judgment of God, God's intention was to show them mercy. Although they were living in a way that warranted His wrath and warranted His judgment, it was the desire of his heart to save people from his wrath. It was the desire of his heart to save people from a coming judgment. 
Amen. You see, although his justice demands it, God has no delight in judging the wicked for their sin. Amen. Although his justice demands it, God has absolutely no delight in judging people for their sin. He, he has no delight in seeing a people who have determined to live their lives apart from him, overcome by sin and overcome by the spirit of this world. The prophet Micah said in Micah chapter 7 that he does not delight in judgment, but he delights in in mercy. Amen. His delight is never to judge and never to pour out wrath. His ultimate delight is to save, to redeem, yes. and to manifest his mercy in the hearts and lives of those who will allow him to. Amen. Th this is why Peter said that when, when, when there are prophets in the last days that are going to rise and they're going to mock the uh, the idea of the Lord coming back to save his people. You 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 let them know that, that God is certainly coming. And the only reason that God is delaying, the only reason that God is being patient with his coming is because he has a desire in his heart to yes. save men from their sin. Yes. That's why he's delayed his coming. Because God is not willing that any should perish, yes. but he is willing that all should come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus yes. Christ. He's not willing that any should perish apart from him. But his desire is that all men would come to repentance and they would know the life of God that is found in his son, Jesus Christ. Yes. And this is why the Lord speaks to Ezekiel. And he says, Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30, that before judgment came, he said, I sought for a man. I, I sought for someone to stand in the gap. You understand that many cities in that day and in that hour were walled cities. And these, these walls around these cities were, number one, they were a sign of these cities' independence from uh, maybe other nations and other peoples. And then secondly, you know, these walls were meant as uh, a means of defense against ensuing enemies and armies who would maybe want to wage war against them. And the gap that the Lord is talking about in Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, the gap, it, it, it refers to a breach or a break in the wall of the city. And in the day of battle, uh, the breach, the break in this wall would, would cause the particular inhabitants of that city to be more vulnerable to ensuing enemies. If, if the enemies who were trying to come against this particular city, if, if they found a gap, a break in the wall, or, or if they went as far as to, to, to create one themselves, they could penetrate the city. And if they penetrated the wall of that city, they could get inside the city and they could begin to wreak all sorts of, of havoc and destruction. And so, if a city found out that an army was coming to wage war against them and, and they did not have time to repair the break or the breach in the wall, particular soldiers of that army would be responsible for standing in the gap. And, and in the day of battle, these soldiers, that their one job and their one responsibility was to stand between the people of that city and the enemies that were coming to destroy them. Their one job, their one responsibility was to stand in the breach of this wall between the inhabitants of their city and the enemies that were intent on destroying them. And, and so long as these soldiers mounted this defense, they, they filled this gap as we see in verse 30, they would keep destruction from coming to the city. They, they, they would, in essence, spare the lives of many people. Now, now, I want you to know that this would have been a very costly task. This, this would have been a task and a responsibility that would have almost demanded that a man lay down his life. It, it would have almost demanded that a man lay down his life for the good and for the welfare of his city. It would have been a costly task. 
You can imagine the first, the second, the third row of soldiers that had to assume that responsibility as, as enemy nations would come against that city and they would be throwing uh, spears and, and arrows and swords and all of these other things. And, and you can imagine how quickly the lines of defense would fall. But, but, but behind the first row of soldiers would be another row and another row and another row. And their, their whole responsibility and their whole purpose was to keep that enemy nation from getting into the city because if they got into the city then hope could be lost mm -hmm. and so it was a very costly task but but if the man if the soldier if, if he valued the life and the reputation of his city to such a degree it would be an accepted task and so what, the, what God by speaking to the prophet Ezekiel, what, what, what God is saying, he, he's using this picture of a, of a gaping hole in the wall of Jerusalem to, to symbolize his people's unwillingness to heed his voice and to live for them, to live for him. And, and, and their unwillingness to walk with God would have left them completely defenseless in the day of judgment. That their, their unwillingness to say yes to God would have left them completely open and completely bare to the judgment and to the wrath of God. And so God was telling that people devastation is coming because of the people's sin. It was coming to the people because of their sin. But while judgment was on the way, I was looking for someone who would stand in the gap. I, I was looking for someone who would stand between judgment and the people. The evidence that God intended to be merciful to that generation was that he desired to have someone who would believe for mercy instead of judgment. The, the, the evidence that God wanted to be merciful to a sinful and a rebellious people was that he longed for someone to stand up and to say, God, instead of judgment, send mercy. God, forgive us of our sin. And instead of your wrath and instead of your judgment, God, let us experience the mercy and the salvation of of God. Amen. Beloved, I say to you that this generation is on a fast track towards judgment. But, but just as he did then, God is intending to be merciful one more time to this generation. He is intending to give us a moment of mercy. Amen. And the evidence that God is intending to show men mercy in this generation is you. You are the evidence that God intends to save and to redeem men out of a sinful and a rebellious society. You are the evidence, beloved. Yes, yes. You are the evidence. You, man, woman, boy or girl, not just the preacher. The fact that you are here, you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are filled with God's Holy Spirit. And the fact that you are still in this earth is evidence that God is intending to save men out of this wicked and perverse generation. Yes, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have to believe that. You have to believe that God intends to use your life to show mercy to this generation. Yes, Lord. If God did not intend to save men and women through your life, you would be dead by now. The reason that you are living is because God has an intention, a desire, and a purpose for your life. And that intention and that desire and that purpose, though it may look differently played out in the lives of each one of us, that purpose is to see men and women brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's easy to just sit back and say, well, you know, judgment is coming and, and, and people are just going to get what they deserve. Lord help. And if we're not careful, we do that. Yeah. Well, judgment's coming, you know, and the world can just die and go to hell. And it doesn't bother me because I've got a church and, and I attend my church and we do good things at our church while the world all around us is dying help. apart from the influence of God. Help us. And we can just sit back and we can say judgment is coming, you know, who cares? But where's the heart of God in that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where's the heart of God in that? Beloved, a fair 
Pharisee can do that. A Pharisee can look at the world and say, you know what? They're just going to get what they deserve. But only a man who's been touched by God and who has had a revelation of, 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 of his salvation and the wrath and the judgment that God has saved him from. Yes. Only that man can stand before God and say, God, don't send judgment yet. We Amen. still need time for men to come to Hallelujah. salvation. Yes. We still need time for men and women to be saved from their sin. Yes. I want to go to heaven. I've got family members over the past three weeks that have gone to heaven one after another. There's another one that may go to heaven today. I don't know. I want to go to heaven as bad as you do. But I know this, that God is intending to save men out of this generation. And that's why he's not allowed us to go yet. Yes. That's why. It's easy to say that. But where is the heart of God in? You too. You and I both, we were once candidates for God's wrath and for God's judgment. But someone stood in the gap on our behalf. Yes, when we were completely defenseless, God had sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to stand between His wrath and us. And instead of the wrath, instead of the judgment of God being poured out upon us because of our rebellion and because of our sin, the wrath and the judgment of God was assuaged through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He reconciled us through the death of the cross. And beloved, now that He has reconciled us, He has made us the ministers of reconciliation. Jesus. That means that because God has saved you, you now share with Him. Yes. In the ministry of saving other yes. people. You now share with him in the responsibility. Of seeing to it that men and women have an opportunity to be saved from their sin. Yes. Amen. He stood in the gap on our behalf. And now he intends to use us to stand in the gap on the behalf of other people. Whether you know it or not, beloved, someone... Someone was willing to live for a purpose that was greater than themselves. That's why you're here today. Amen. Amen. That is the only reason that you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. is because somebody down the line said, I believe the message of the gospel and I'm going to relay that message to somebody else. Amen. It's because somebody was not occupied by their own sense of, of self-importance and, and, and self-worth. They were occupied with the will of God to save men from their sin. And, and that's why you're here, beloved. Someone's prayers made a difference in your life, whether you know it or not. Yes. Somebody's fasting and travailing before God made a difference in your life. Someone's willingness to stand behind a sacred desk like I'm doing today and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, it made a difference in your life. Right. Yes, Lord. The reason you're here is because somebody stood in the gap for you. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you saw it or not, whether you realized it or not, somebody stood between you and the wrath of God that you rightfully deserve, and they said, God, save them. Yeah. God, spare them. God, do in their life what you have done in mine. Someone has to believe that God intends to show mercy to this generation. Somebody has to be jealous for the glory of God. Yeah. And I want you to know that God is not glorified in, 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 through a generation that is suffering at, at the hands of sin and of Satan. God is not glorified in that. God is glorified when people are saved from yes. their sin. When they are empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk in victory uh, uh, over the things that once held them in bondage yes. and in captivity. Amen. That's where God gets His glory. Hallelujah. God never wanted His people to be in captivity. That's right. It was never His intention for them to be prisoners of a foreign empire. In, in, in bondage, as it were, to the spirit of that age. It was never God's yes. intention. It was God's intention to spare them. And to save them and to raise them up to be a testimony Hallelujah. for his name's sake to the world around them. That's why God created them. Mm. Yeah. Twofold purpose for God in his creation of man. It was to be in relationship with that man and it was to use that man right. Right. to further his glory in the earth. Good That's why we were created in the image of God. 
And it was the intention of God that we would bear his image. We would be image bearers to this generation. But because of our sin and because of our rebellion, that image has been greatly marred. But although the image has been marred, beloved, you must hear me this morning. Although the image has been marred, it is God's intention to restore it back to what it once was. Yes. It is God's intention that when the world looks at you and I, they can see very clearly the testimony of Jesus Christ. That they can see it. It will cost you. It will. But I'm telling you, it will be worth everything that it costs you. If you're going to be an instrument of God's mercy, it will cost you greatly. If you'll allow me to say it this way, it'll cost you your life. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is that there's got to be a willingness that enters your heart to lay down your life for a purpose that is greater than the one that you've held to all of Come your on, life. Come on, brother, that's a good preach. And, and they may be dreams and aspirations and plans that may be not sinful in themselves, but the question has to be asked, uh, do they fit in, in, into God's intention and purpose yes, for my life? Lord. Is my life being lived in such a way that, that it is obvious that, that I am an instrument of God's mercy to this generation? Somebody has to believe that God can be merciful. Yes. God was telling Ezekiel judgment was coming. And up to this point, it, it seemed as though no one cared. It, it seemed as though no one was concerned about the trajectory of the nation. N no one seemed to care that God's name was no longer revered as it once was. Uh, no one seemed to care that the nation was going to suffer grave consequences for her sin if something did not change. And I'm reminded of a story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Many of you know the story, the story of David and Goliath. There was, there was a time and an hour when this man by the name of Goliath, who was a giant in that generation, he, he came to the nation of Israel and he began to mock uh, the nation of Israel. He began to taunt the people of God, in essence telling them that they would never be successful in being who it was that God had called them and created them to be. He showed up one day openly defying the name of God, openly blaspheming Yahweh, openly blaspheming the God of Israel and really mocking their God, saying that their God was was not able to deliver them from this taunt and from this attack that, that God would never get His glory through their lives. And then one day, there's this little shepherd boy by the name of David. Yeah. And, and you know the story. David, this particular day, he, he's, he's not a soldier as his brothers were. David was just a shepherd boy. And at this point in his life, his sole responsibility, his primary responsibility... The responsibility, I should say, was to take care of his father's sheep. Yeah. And so while his brothers were fighting uh, against uh, the Philistines and, and, and trembling in their boots before this Goliath, uh, one day David's father says to him, David, I want you to take some bread and some cheese and uh -huh. some other things, and I want you to take them to the field of battle so that your brothers can have something to eat. And, and so David, in his obedience to his father, he does this. And, and he's not even fully aware of what's taking place on the field of battle that day. But, but, but David gets to the field of battle and he hears this giant mm -hmm. that, that, is, that is mocking and defaming the God of Israel. Oh, he, he, hears, he hears that this giant is towering over Israel as it were. And, and he's telling them that there is no hope for their future. That, that all, of, all the days of their life, this was Goliath's testimony. You read it. That all the days of their life, they were not going to serve Yahweh. They were going to serve the Philistines. They were going to serve the false gods of the day. And David is not there to fight. He, he, he's not a soldier and he doesn't look like one in any way, shape, form, or fashion. He's just a, a young man. But, but David hears this defamation. He hears this blasphemy. And, and something rises up in David yeah. and, and says, Is somebody going to do something about this? 
Is somebody going to stand up to this bully, if you will? Is somebody going to have enough of the name of our God being blasphemed and not being revered as it once was? Is somebody going to have enough and do something about this giant? And David, in the face of certain defeat, in that moment, believed that God could use his life to make a difference. Yes. David believed that, that as small and as insignificant as I may look in the eyes of these soldiers and these captains and these men who have for decades served in this military, in the eyes of these men, I believe that God can use my life Hallelujah. to make a difference. And, and, and David goes to them and, 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 and at the risk, at the risk of being misunderstood, at the risk of being slandered, at the risk of being looked down upon, David goes to his brothers, he goes to these soldiers, and he says, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for somebody to rise up and to defy this giant that has been defying the name of our God? Hallelujah. And, and, and that day, David believed that God could take what little that he had and what yeah. little that he was. David believed that God could use him to save an entire generation of people yeah. from the intentions and the purposes of hell. Yes, Lord. And so at the risk of being misunderstood, at the risk of being slandered and looked look down upon, he shows up to the field of battle, ready to defy the giant that had defied the name of God. Hallelujah! He said, I refuse for a day longer for the name of God to suffer defamation in my community. I, I refuse for a day longer for the name of God to suffer defamation in my household. I, re I refuse for a day longer for the name of God to suffer defamation in my generation. I believe that God can use my life to do Hallelujah. something about Hallelujah. it. Hallelujah. And while David didn't have a sword and a spear and a shield as Goliath did, David had the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. And he came to Goliath and he said, you come to me with sword and shield and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And I want you to know that that day Israel experienced victory because one man determined that all of the world would know that God was fully capable and able of saving his people from Satan's intentions yes. and desires for their lives. Hallelujah. And I don't believe personally, I don't believe it was that God was unwilling to show mercy to Israel prior to David's arrival. I just believe that David assumed the position of being the means through which God would yes. do it. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, yeah. anybody who believes for mercy, God says, it's my intention to use their lives. Yeah. Beloved, you are the proof that God intends to show mercy Hallelujah. to this generation. The fact that he has saved you, filled you with his spirit, and left you in this earth is proof positive that he wants to save men. Amen. From their sin. That's it. Judgment is coming. Mark my words. The day of the Lord is soon upon us. I believe that with all of my heart. There, there, we've not seen bad yet. 2020 is nothing in comparison to what this world is going to see before the coming of the Lord. I just believe that the Bible is very clear about that. God is eventually... Going to allow his wrath and his judgment to be poured out on this world. Mm -hmm. But until he has enough right, right. of this world and its sin and its rebellion against him, he has you. Mm. Until he has had enough, mm. he has you. The evidence that God was intent on, intent on saving the world from their sin was that he came to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And the evidence that God is still intent on saving men from their sin is that he is present in this world through the means of his church. 
you must believe that God can use your life to make a difference. Amen. God said, Ezekiel, before judgment came, I sought for a man. I sought for someone, anyone, who believed that I could send mercy. Who believed that I could save men and women from a coming judgment. Not just a prophet or a priest. I looked for anyone who was willing to assume the position, anyone who was willing to stand in the gap and to be an instrument, if you will, of salvation to that generation. There are two things that have been in my heart very strongly and very deeply over the past couple of weeks. And it's this desire in my heart to see people freed. And first, what I mean by that is that I want to see people freed from the thought and the estimation that because someone else is doing it or because someone else has done it, that, that they are somehow excluded from the responsibility of being who God wants them to be in this generation. <laughs> Beloved, if we're going to be successful in this generation for the cause of Jesus Christ, it's going to take a group effort. Yeah. It's going to have to be more than just the evangelist that sees thousands of people brought to salvation at a time. It's going to have to be more than just the pastor who assumes the pulpit every Sunday morning and faithfully preaches the word of God to his people. It's going to have to be men and women. They may not be a fivefold minister, but they're a minister of reconciliation because the spirit of God lives within them. There ought to have been a battalion of soldiers spiritually speaking, who are willing to stand in the gap on behalf of Israel. But God said I could find none. And so first, I want to see people freed from the opinion that there's no responsibility upon my life to do anything for the cause of Christ. And listen, don't get in the business of comparing yourself with the next guy. Come on. Because somewhere along the line, you're going to fall short or you're going to look better than them. That's right. And, and God is not interested in the game of comparison. That's good, brother. Find the will of God for your life. Yes. And, and, and ask God for the help and the anointing of His Spirit to faithfully fulfill the calling that He has placed upon your life. You. And what you're going to find is that when you begin to seek God's heart for that, He is going to give you gifts that you had no idea were there. He's going to begin to do things through your life that you never thought or imagined He could do because He's simply looking for a vessel. He's simply looking for someone through which he can manifest this desire of his in the earth. Amen. It's supernatural. Amen. And he wants to equip you to accomplish it. And so first, I want to see people freed from the idea that there's no responsibility upon my life. That, 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 that God has not called me. He's called them, but he's not called me. And, and, and secondly, I want to see people freed from the thought that God cannot use their life to make a, a significant difference in their world. I want to see people freed from that. I meet Christians all of the time. That for whatever reason, they have come to a place, they have been led to believe that their lives are very insignificant and that their lives individually cannot make a difference in their generation. Beloved, God's not just calling fivefold ministers. Amen. Amen. He's calling men and women. Yes. Amen. He's calling people. And when He calls you, He gives you the ability that you need yes. to attend to the call. You say it's too great for you. I agree wholeheartedly. Amen. But that's why the Spirit of God resides within yes. you. Yes. People, are, they just think that because they've, they've fumbled the ball, so to speak, in times past, that God will never use them uh, to, 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 run the ball to, get, to run the ball again. But, but, but if, if God waited for, for faultless or failure-free people to do anything in the earth, He would be waiting until we all got to heaven. That's right. Amen. And so the reason that you're here is because God is intending to use your life to make a difference in this generation. With, with, with so much difficulty and, and with so much distraction pervading our world in this moment, we, we cannot lose sight of what our purpose in the earth really is. If we forget that our main priority is to see people saved from darkness, 
and brought into the kingdom of God, then we lose our identity. Power absent of purpose is absolutely pointless. Jesus said, don't rejoice just because the devils are subject to you. Rejoice because your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. And, and, and in other words, rejoice that you've been given the ability to see other people Amen. and their names written down in the Lamb's book of life. So often, especially in spirit-filled circles, we, we boast of our power, but, but our power doesn't move us to people. And Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 58 that a religion that, that is absent of the compassion of God is powerless. Mm -hmm. It is a religion that God cannot bless nor will he honor. But, but if God finds a people who understand that their purpose is to see men and women in their respective generations set free from the power of sin, God blesses those people and he empowers them to do what they could have never imagined they could do in themselves. Praise God. This is what he does. Praise God. This is what he does. God has given his church the power of his spirit. Not to just sing about. Not to just boast in. Well, the church, you know, our church, unlike that other church, our church lets the spirit move. You know, we have we have words of wisdom and prophecy and tongues and interpretation and times of prayer and all of these supernatural things. Praise God for that. Amen. But the reason he does those things is to strengthen us to go out into this world and to yeah. make a difference for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. It, it, it's so that mama can go home and be the mama that God has called her to be. Somebody yeah. help me right yeah. now. It, it's so that daddy can go yeah. home and yeah. be the daddy that God has called him to be. Right. It, it, it's right. so that these children in children's church can go home and make a difference in the lives of their family members. Amen. Amen. We, we've got to believe that God has the ability to do this through our lives. We have to believe it, beloved. Yes. Yes. We have to believe this with all of our hearts that God can use our lives to make a significant impact on the world around us. Amen. He's not given us his spirit and his power to just sit comfortably while the world perishes. Yeah, that's he, he's given us the power of his Holy Spirit to make a difference in the lives of those that are around us. Amen. It was God's intention for Israel from their beginning, from the outset, to be a people through whom, as we've said so many times, that he could manifest his glory through, that he could glorify his own name through. You remember times when, even when Israel was first brought out of bondage in, in, in the book of Exodus, God, God would tell them that I'm, I'm, I'm delivering you, I'm saving you. So that the world would know that I am God and that I am mighty to save and all of these other things. And so it is the intention of God to have a people through whom he can evidence his glory. But do God's intentions go unrealized at times? Absolutely. That, that's really the story of the entire Old Testament. Is that God raised up a people through whom he would bless the world, but they, they failed in that responsibility. And that's really the story of Ezekiel 22, is that God was intending to raise up people through whom he could glorify himself through, through whom he could be a blessing to those generations, but they refused it through their unbelief and their unwillingness to say yes to him. Don't let it be said of our generation. That no one stood in the gap. Don't let it be said of our families that we refuse to stand in the gap. That we refuse to believe for salvation. That we refuse to believe that instead of a coming judgment and a coming wrath, they could experience a, 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 an eternal life with God apart from sin, apart from Satan and all of the bondages that he tries to put upon our lives, let us be a people that really believe that God is intentional about saving men and women that are all around us. Let us be a people that believe with all of our hearts that if he saved us, oh God, if he saved me, if you only knew who I was before Christ, 
If he saved me, then God is well able and he is desirous to save people in this generation. Nile, would you come and yeah. just begin to play? What the Lord was saying to Ezekiel that if I was that if I could have just found one, things could have been different. If I could have just found one man. This is what the Lord says. He said, I sought for a man. He didn't say I sought for a prophet or I sought for a priest. I, I just sought for someone who would turn their heart to me and believe that I was able and desirous to bring salvation to that generation. God says one man, one man. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but as I see it, that's what God was saying to Ezekiel. I look for one person. And, and if I would have found one person, it would have made all the difference. It could have saved a generation. We, we, we talk about past revivals and we talk about moves of God that have touched generations past. Moves of God that, that touched the world for the cause of Christ. And I want you to know that as you, as, you, as you look at the beginnings of those revivals, as you look at the start of them, it was never a multitude that were crying out for, for revival and for a move of God's Spirit. Many times it was one, it was two, it was three people who, who became tired of the way things were in their generation. They, they were tired of the people of God living apart from the power and the influence of God. They got sick of dead, dry religion. They got tired of, of men's hearts just being turned inward and toward themselves and not toward the glory of God. They got tired of it. And they began to pray. They began to seek God. And God honored their prayers and God answered them and God met with them and God used their lives to make lasting impacts upon their respective generations. I'm not satisfied with things the way that they are. I'm not. I'm sorry. I, I refuse to just settle for the way things are in my family and the way things are in my communities. I want to believe that God can use my life to make a difference. I'm not saying that we should expect that God would use us to save a whole generation. But my God, if He can use us to save one out of this generation, if He could use us to save one family out of this generation, if He could use us to touch one neighborhood, in the midst of this rebellious and sinful society, what glory that would bring to God through our lives. What glory it would bring to God. And, and it's not just temporary dividends, beloved. You understand that, that it's eternal dividends. That, that people for forever and for eternity will have the opportunity to spend eternity in the presence of God. Free from their sin, free from their oppression, free from the things that have held them for all of these years. They'll, they'll have the opportunity to know God in His presence for eternity. I know that 2020 has been a very difficult year. But I believe with all of my heart that the Lord is trying to get us to recapture our, our purpose and our intention for being here. You remember in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus was getting ready to ascend, all the disciples could think about were, Lord, are, are you going to save us from this generation? Are you going to come right back and restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to rid us of all of, of, of this world and its ailments and all of the things that come with it? Or are you going to come and overthrow this, this, this Roman government so that, so that we can know you and, and be, be, be totally absent of all of this conflict? And Jesus responded to them by saying that it's not for you to know the hour or the seasons that the Father's placed in His hand. And this, is what, this, this was His response to them. It, it, it was not a sure answer as to their question. It was simply this. But I'll give you power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And, and with that power, you're going to be given the ability to be a witness for Christ in your generation. And so if you're not 
in heaven, there's a purpose for your life. And I've given you power to accomplish that purpose and it's to affect the hearts and lives of other people. God has fully deposited himself within every one of us who are saved by his blood. And he fully intends on using what he's deposited within you to save somebody. To see somebody healed of sickness and disease. To see somebody set free from bondage and from dead religion. To, to see somebody brought into the life and the reality of God. God fully intends on using your life, beloved. Believe that. In spite of the failure, in spite of the fault, ask God to forgive you. Ask Him to wash you. Yes, absolutely. But God has never... In any generation, he's never waited for someone who had it just right in order to use their lives to do something significant for his kingdom. He's never done it. God is just looking for someone who will believe. I want to see people delivered from the thought that God cannot use my life because of some weakness or some inability, some intrinsic struggle in my life. If that's you this morning, would you just believe God? Would you stand with me this morning, everyone? Would you stand with me? And if that's you this morning, that, that maybe you've, you've found yourself trying to exclude yourself from, from the call and the responsibility to be that minister of reconciliation, or, or, or maybe you, you, you know the call, you know the responsibility, but, but somewhere along the line, you've been made to believe that, that, that you can't be used to make a difference. That, that, that your life cannot be used to bring God glory. If, if, if that's you, I just want you to talk to the Lord right now. Talk to Him. And I just want you to ask Him with all of your heart. Ask Him to help you to believe that He can, in fact, use your life to bring glory to Jesus Christ. That if God could take a liar like Peter, a denier like Peter, somebody who should have known better, yet he failed so dramatically in his responsibility. If God could redeem his life and use it to bring glory to his name, can't God use you? Yes. If God could take Paul a, a man who prior to his salvation was literally literally persecuting and, and responsible for the death of people in the kingdom of God. If God could show mercy to him, and if God could fill his life with a sense of purpose and fill him with power to make a difference in his generation, if God could do that for him, don't you believe that God can do it for you? Oh, mighty God. Father, I ask right now, Lord, with all of my heart, God. God, I ask you right now, Lord, for a renewed sense of confidence in the hearts of your people. Father, I don't know where and through whom they've been lied to, but God, I, help, I ask that you would help them right now, Father, to see who they are in Christ Jesus. To, to see that it would become a reality to them, God. It would become revelation, illumination to them this morning. Yeah. God, of who they are in Jesus Christ, that, that you have purchased them, you've bought them, God. Yes. God, you've taken them out of darkness and you've translated them into the kingdom of your dear Son. And, and now it is your desire and your intention and intention to use them, God, to make a difference in this world for your name's sake. Father, that it would be more than words on a page. It would be more than just this preacher telling them that today. That it would be it would be granted to them by the Holy Spirit, God, to see, God, their significance in the kingdom of God. To see, Lord, your willingness, God, to use them for a purpose that is greater than even their own, God. And, God, to use them in ways that their mind right now, it, it cannot even begin to fathom or imagine. God, God, to use their lives in ways that, that they've never even thought that someone could be used. Yes. Oh, God, we call upon the God that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or thank. God, help us, Lord God. Help 
help us to say yes to you. God, I believe that through this text, God, it's been so clear that it's your intention to show mercy to this generation, but God, help us to believe that you can do it through us. Yes. Help us this morning, Lord. Yes. Help us, Lord. God, that we can be an evidence of your mercy, your desire to save this generation. God, that it would be more than just mere words that come from our mouths. But God, it would be lives that are, that are lived under the inspiration of God. Lives that are lived under the influence of God. Lives that are different. Uh, they're not selfish and self-seeking. But, but they're lives that are willing to be laid down for the good and the welfare of other people. So that others would have the opportunity to know this Christ. Lord, this world has had enough of religion. Oh God, they must know reality. The reality of God lived in and through a life by the Holy Spirit. Oh God. God, I think of Paul when he came into church at Thessalonica and he said that our word came to you. Not in word only, but in power and in demonstration of the Spirit. And Paul said to that church that because of the manner of men that we were, be, be, because you witnessed that there was a reality of God in our lives, that the, that the people that stood before you were people who had truly been changed by the grace and the love of God, because of that you were willing to say yes to Jesus Christ. Oh God, let a demonstration of Christ God be seen with the proclamation of him God. Jesus did not die, beloved. He did not die just to give us a message to preach. He died to give us a life to live. A life to live under the inspiration and influence of His Holy Spirit. When Jesus died at Calvary, the veil was torn, giving us the opportunity to know the presence of God. And not just to know about Him, but for Him to live within us and empower us to do what we could never imagine doing in ourselves. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to ask you if we could just take maybe a moment, maybe 60 seconds, 120 seconds as Naya plays and sings. We could just take a moment and worship the Lord. We can thank Him, number one, for His willingness and His desire to use us. And secondly, we could ask Him to show us in what avenues He desires to use us. Yes. But know this, He does desire to use you, beloved. Yes. He does desire to use you. Let us not just sit back while this world gets closer and closer to a judgment. Let us assume our responsibility. Not a law thing but a Spirit-inspired thing. Just a people who are empowered by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, to make a difference in our generation. 